namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo saranto suche doye olahudi sammyao sanputoshe. Ushang shen shen wei miao fa. 百千万劫难遭遇我今见闻得受持愿皆如来真实意 Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Hung Shur. Uh, I haven't seen you for a month. It's a great to be back. I wanted to express my appreciation to Dharma Master Jin Fu and to Dharma Master Jin Chuan for standing in on my behalf and turning the Dharma wheel with the Sutra of Limitless Lifespan, one of the Pure Land texts. And uh, it's wonderful to have a community of Dharma friends who can step in and, and uh, hold everybody's interest in the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, even though the, the text is different, the, uh, the intent, the energy, the uh, causes and conditions are the same. And uh, Master Hua would say, it doesn't matter how well you lecture, what matters is how well you can listen, right? So even if somebody can't lecture, if you can really listen, it's a wonderful lecture. When we have Dharma Master Jinfo, who uh, uh, does deep research every week for his his own weekly lecture. Uh, he took on my my share of the work and was lecturing on it twice. So that meant he was sitting with his glasses in front of glasses on eyeglasses on in front of the text for hours and hours uh, during the week to prepare his stories and his principles that he illustrates from the sutra. So we're back with the Flower Garland Sutra, the Ten Stages chapter. So. Let's jump in. Tonight, uh, this afternoon's text is particularly tasty. There's a lot of uh, interest, uh, interesting aspects to today's text. So I'm going to zoom up to the invocation part and then come back to page 48 and 49 um, in our manuscript. Here we go. And we invoke, with a little bit of music, we add a tune. And I have my Ashoka banjo, the uh, Dharma wheel banjo, it's here. sounds flat. Indeed it is. Fixed. Heaven and earth once again is in harmony. Ready? We can put our palms together if you choose to do so, if you care to do so, join us and we're going to ask the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to bring the sutra forward for us. Namo da fang guang fu ba yin jing wa yin ha o ku sa namo da fang guang fu Oh, 
winding high and high, O Pusa. magnificent spring afternoon here in southeastern Queensland. Uh, we've had a rain recently and the uh, dryness of summer is underway but the rain came just at the right time to soften everything and uh, the uh, sun is up at 5.30 now instead of 90 minutes or earlier as it was in the winter so and it goes down later at night so we've got more hours of sun and uh, the birds are multiplying we've got baby birds uh, in the nest and the eggs are hatching and I'll I have a story to share later on today about uh, the encounters with nature in a single day that happen here in the Queensland bush, in the forest uh, on the coast of the ocean here in southeastern Queensland. Now, the part of the text that I mentioned that we're going to be investigating, uh, I, I won't interpret it first. I'll ex read it first, invite you to read it with me, and then we will uh, talk about First we look at what it says and then we investigate together what it might mean. All right. Um, this is the last paragraph we explained last time and we'll repeat it to give us the context. Uh, I'm gonna do the Chinese first and welcome to join me if you care to. Here we go. Er shi hui zhong zhu pu sa ji tian long ye cha Chen Ta Po O Xiu Lo Hu Shi Si Wang Shi Ti Huan Yin Fan Tian Jing Ju Mo Xi Xiu Lo Zhu Tian Zi Deng Xian Zuo Shi Nian Pu Sa Ruo Pu Sa Shan Tong Zhi Li Neng Ru Shi Zhe Fo Fu Yun He They said What was that? What did they mean? At that time, all the bodhisattvas within the assembly, along with the gods, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, the four world-protecting kings, Chakra Devanam, Indra, the god Brahma, the pure-dwelling gods, Maheshvara, and all the other gods and others, had the following thought together. If bodhisattvas can have such powers of wisdom and spiritual abilities, what about the Buddha? So people who've been with us on this journey know that we're investigating the Flower Garland Sutra called the Abhatamsaka in Sanskrit, Huayanjing, Keigonkyo in Japanese. And the main topic, if you had to pick out just one of the Flower Garland Sutra is bodhisattvas. What, what do they do? What do they think? What do they say? How do they react? How do they practice? Who are they? Do I know one you know, or more? Uh, that's, the sutra answers those questions. No exaggeration, it does. It, this is what the text is about, among other myriad topics. We are in the chapter of that sutra that is really laser focused on, that, on answering those questions. It's called the Dashabhumi 
the ten stages, uh, often translated the ten grounds. Hmm? Think of an elevator going up, different floors, different stages. That's the. There are said to be 52, sometimes 53 stages in the Bodhisattva path, and the sutra uh, outlines them. There of the it's divided into ten portions, ten parts. We're on number 10. Um, we've been working at this for years now. And uh, the 10th stage is called the stage of the cloud of Dharma, the Dharma cloud stage, Fa Yun Di. And it is the crowning stage, no doubt about it, um, which splendor, magnificence, has now caused the audience of the dialogue going on in the chapter to have doubts, which I think is fascinating in terms of religion. Uh, so the why are people asking this question? What are they asking? They're saying, who is it? Specifies bodhisattvas who are there listening to a story being told. This part of the text is a dialogue. It's a story. There's a storyteller. His name is Vajra Treasury, Treasury of Adamantine, Treasury of Vajra Bodhisattva. He's a, a Bodhisattva Mahasattva. He's a Bodhisattva among Bodhisattvas. And he's having a conversation with another Bodhisattva whose name is Chietoye, Liberated Moon or Moon of Liberation or uh, Lunar Liberation. Uh, he is the interlocutor, he's the questioner, he's the guy who asks the questions. He starts the conversation off representing everybody else who has come to hear the Buddha speak. And the Buddha's not speaking. Hmm. Are they disappointed? No, because one of the conventions, one of the strategies of the Avatamsaka Sutra is that the Buddha speaks rarely, but he deputizes other beings, bodhisattvas, sometimes even gods, devas, to speak for him. So we're hearing the Buddha's dharma through the mouths of others. It's the Buddha's wisdom, but reflected through different, the experience of different bodhisattvas, okay? The 10th stage is all taught by Vajra Treasury. He is asked by Moon of Liberation, Bodhisattva. Okay, there we go. It's a storytelling, but it's like an, there's a, uh, it's a big gathering. It's a, mm, Greek, people who appreciate Greek tragedies, right? Great Greek drama, for example or Sanskrit drama, or Persian drama. The, these, this high literature that comes down to us from the origins of our own Western, Hellenistic, Judaic traditions know about the power of speakers with an audience, right? The audience. And in Greek drama, for example, there is a chorus who repeats the plot points and the great oratory of the speaker just so the audience won't miss it. So it's very much a, say theatrical, theatrical makes you think it's somehow fictional, it's not, this is documentary stuff. But there's a bit of that, there's a flavor in the, in the Avatamsaka, in the 10 stages, of a performance for an audience. There's a little bit of that there. The Bodhisattva Vajra Treasury is uh, very conscious of the assembly, and so is his questioner, his dialogue partner, Moon of Liberation, who is always referring to the audience, right? So it's very cool. It's not boring. It's not prosaic. It's not dull at all. There's surprise. Uh, there's the dynamics of challenging new material. The 
people don't get at first hearing. So what do they do? The Buddha says, uh, do not accept what I'm telling you on faith. If you have a question, ask it. If you have a doubt, raise it. If you have uh, a wish to uh, go deeper, I want to hear about it. Because my job in speaking the Dharma is to satisfy your uh, intellect and to touch your feelings at the same time and to tease your curiosity and to, we don't say these things, to kick your butt, right? Nobody wants their butt kicked. We want, it's painful. We want to move you. We want to inspire your progress. All these things that the Buddha hopes will happen uh, as he speaks Dharma expediently with a number of strategies and, and technologies and skills in order to infuse us, the listener. That's the other part of this theatrical storytelling thing is that we here in 2020, in October 2020, stand in for the audience at the time this Dharma was first spoken. So there's a timeless quality too. We are the audience whom the Buddha is, through his bodhisattvas, are hoping to uh, seed down with vital, fertile seeds that then will sprout, will flower, will fruit, will harvest the crops of bodhi, of awakening, right? So that's, that's people who say, oh, that flower garland sutra, that's just Buddhist philosophy. Never read it. Never opened it. This is, this is high drama, right? So that's the context. Ready? Ready for today's, today's uh, first opening scene? What is it? At that time, the bodhisattvas in the assembly, along with big list of who was there, camera pans over to the listeners, right? Uh, Avatamsaka's got talent, right? The cameras, who's there? Who's reacting to the, the speaker on the stage? There are gods from all the different heavens. There are dragons, you betcha, right? Dragon kings are right there sitting beside you in the bleachers. Peanuts, uh, uh, peanuts, give me a, you know. Give me a wet one. Who else? Yakshas, ghosts. Not only ghosts, but flesh-eating, blood-drinking ghosts. Yakshas, who are on their best behavior, because this is the Buddha, Buddha's assembly. Gandharvas, musical spirits. Gandharvas, who are just, you know, they, when they play their harps, people fall into trances. They're, they're just such powerful musical spirits. Asuras. Asuras are these titans, these uh, aggressive beings who uh, are power hungry and uh, unable to let things rest. They have to poke it up, right? Asuras. Four world protecting kings, the, the deva kings whose job is to subdue demons, show up to hear the Dharma. Chakra Devanam Indra, who, are, who is the chief among gods in the desire realm heavens. Brahma, the chief among gods in the form heavens. So these are the, the heavy duty bosses of the cosmology, the Buddha's cosmology, who are here sitting quietly, listening to Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva turn the Dharma wheel. And who else? The pure dwelling gods, gods in Samadhi from the form realm, from the Brahma heaven, right? Maheshvara, who is this fascinating character whom somebody should do dissertation research on his uh, aspects of Maheshvara, the great Ishvara. Maha Ishvara becomes Maheshvara. This guy rides a three-eyed white ox, goes from the desire realm to the form realm and back, and uh, has lots of fabulous lore and stories about Maheshvara. All the other gods who are here, thrilled to be among this august assembly of the gods, the dragons, and the eightfold pantheon of spiritual beings. The gods here, Srifa would say, don't even have a place to sit. They have to stand. 
Master Hua would say, oh, Lord God, yeah, he's pretty much like a postmaster. You know, he's your <laughs> local, <laughs> he's a, uh, he doesn't get to sit, but he can, he can come, he's, he's, he can stand. He's got a standing room only, SRO, uh, for, for Lord God, because why, he's, he's not gonna displace the Asuras, or he might, maybe the Asuras, but he's not gonna displace, uh, you know, the, uh, the heavy-duty bodhisattvas, certainly. Okay, the camera now has panned around the audience. We know who's there, and it comes back. And Vajra, uh, Moon of Liberation Bodhisattva says, these people are doubting. These beings have not completely understood what you said. And they, I'm representing them. I'm speaking on their behalf to ask you a question that has now, bong, popped up on their internal radar screen. What is the question? You've told us about the 10th stage bodhisattva and what incredible spiritual abilities he has, she has, enabled, enabling you to swap worlds and never, never disturbing any of the inhabitants in the world. All of these things that we've been hearing about, that's on its own, that's incredible. Hearing about the Bodhisattva, we wonder what's left for the Buddha to do. Is a Bodhisattva on the 10th stage the same as the Buddha? That's their question. Okay, so interesting, right? So that's, that's what it said. Now, what does it mean? Here's, here's our sacred text. This is our, this is our heavy duty text, right? This is a big sutra that's explaining the absolute peak master bodhisattva. This is a master level bodhisattva. And the things that the speaker of the text has told the audience, they don't, they don't get it entirely. And they've had a creative thought, which in, from Master Hua, from our, our founder, Shurfa would say, that's a false thought. False thought, right? Why? They're saying, oh, wow, that's very cool. Bodhisattvas can do that. But wait a minute. What's a Buddha? What does a Buddha do? What, how does, if, they, if they can do that, aren't they Buddhas already? They're not 10th stage. What's a 10th stage Bodhisattva in the light of the Buddha? Which is really interesting because the Buddha's teaching the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, allows creative questioning. Right here in the Sutra, we have somebody who's going, wait a minute, I don't, it doesn't add up. In, according to my understanding, please enlighten me where I have gone wrong, or where I'm, where I, what I'm missing, not where I've gone wrong. There's no sense of anything being wrong here. But they have taken it one more step and thought, that's almost unbelievable that the Bodhisattva can do that kind of stuff. What, tell me more, right? I like that attitude. There is room for creative imagination in the realm of the spirit. They don't accept it on face value. There is room for critical thinking at the highest level of cultivation. That's a healthy intellectual environment, right? That allows, even at this point, you would think they would all just kind of nod. You know, oh yeah, mm -hmm, yes, I knew that, yeah. Not. They're all going, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's almost, almost inconceivable to the point of being, I don't accept it, right? Hearing what Vajra Treasury has been saying about the Bodhisattva. Now, let's reflect back. Um, at the very beginning of the, the 10 stages, there was a, an interlude that's fascinating. We, we spent weeks going over that first, first, first scene of the 10 stages chapter of the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is uh, one of the, this is chapter 26 out of 40, 
40 chapters, but it's a key chapter, right? What happened? So the Buddha announced that he was going to explain the 10 stages chapter. And so everybody showed up. The word went out. Dharma assembly, right? Save your seat. You don't want to be late. And so they all showed up and Muna Liberation, there's a bunch of praises. They praise the Buddha's wisdom, his expedience, his compassion. And everybody speaks, they make an offering and they gather. So there's this apprehension of, you know, what's going to come. And Muna Liberation, Chetoyue Bodhisattva, says, the assembled multitudes here wish that you will speak the Dharma, Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva. Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva says, no. <laughs> uh uh. Nope, not going to do it. And that's it. He just tr shuts him down. <laughs> no. And so, Vajra, Muna Liberation Bodhisattva says, uh, you know, uh, this audience is full of real cultivators with accomplishments. They have discerning wisdom. They are subtle. They are uh, well trained. They are disciplined and they can, they can hear it. So please speak. We're waiting. Bajra Treasury Bodhisattva says, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Second request, no. And so Muna Liberation says, well, why not? He says, you don't underestimate this audience. Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva gives his reasons why. He says, this Dharma is too fine, too subtle. Not that you're not, not, not meaning you're not fine enough to hear it. No, it's that he says, what's it like? He gives analogies. He says, it's like the tracks of a bird in space. Bird flies by. Can you see the the traces in the air? Did the bird disturb air currents and you can see it? No, the bird goes, choop, it's gone. There's no, no sign that the bird covered that 50 yards, you know, in 10 seconds. There's no trace. He said, that's the subtlety of the 10 stages Dharma. It's hard to appreciate and if I say something that causes somebody in the assembly to go, eh, what a bunch of nonsense. This is a waste of time. I think this is malarkey, right? He says, I will have caused harm instead of goodness. I don't want people to have doubts and slander, he says. So therefore, I will remain silent, he says. Oh man, you know, there's the answer. No, I'm not gonna say anything because it's too hard to grasp. I don't care how subtle these, these the wisdom of this assembly, he says, it's too risky, it's too difficult. Okay, at that point, that could have been the end if, if that had been allowed to stand. What happens next is fascinating. The Buddha intervenes. The Buddha shows up and says, actually, he says, go ahead. There's more goodness to be created than harm to be risked, right? Better to speak than not speak. I will cover you, you're off the hook, no harm done, no foul. If they don't understand, I will find a way to get them to understand. Go ahead and speak the Dharma. So, Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva, having been um, kind of underwritten by his boss, the Buddha, says, oh, okay. Omi Toho, Bansha Shri he says, I will do it, I'll speak. And that's, then it starts. That's, then you hear the, the stage of happiness, the first stage. Okay, so, bit by bit by bit, through the second, the third, the fourth, all the way up to the ninth, Vajra Treasury has been reassured, indeed, that this, not only the bodhisattvas have gotten it, but the devas have gotten it. And oh, there's celebration, there's joy, there's this gradual learning about what? About the workings of 
the mind slash nature at its peak of refinement, peak of cultivation. That when you, when I, when we cultivate our minds, these abilities, these resources, these qualities emerge from the mind. Right? So if I were to throw an analogy, it's kind of like you've lived in a house, maybe you grew up there, you know every inch of that house because you played on its floors, you've lounged on its sofas, you've opened its windows, you've walked its staircases, you've locked it, unlocked the doors, you've opened and shut the windows, you know this house, right? And then somebody comes in and says, oh, by the way, have you been in the West Wing? Have you been in the attic? Did you know there was a basement? Right? And you go, what? I've lived here my whole life. I didn't know there was a, a wing, attic, a basement. And he opens it up and you go in and there's this marvelous, marvelous space that you can explore and you feel like you're coming alive because your own house contains all these marvelous rooms with all these different feelings in each room and different vistas through the windows and different spaces to to live in, right? So that's why these, these uh, beings in the assembly are thrilled, thrilled to have Vajra Treasury open up these rooms in their mansion of wisdom, right? In their castle of c compassion. So that's, that's what's going on here. Okay, reflecting back on that first encounter where the Buddha says, yeah, yeah, you go ahead. It's all right, don't worry. Thank you for your caution. Don't be too cautious to where you stop the wheel of Dharma turning for fear that you'll make a mistake, right? Don't worry about it, I'll cover you. So that's what happened. Now, okay, all the way along, we've learned more, learn more, learn more, learn more. Absorb the lessons and and just find out these incredible qualities of a bodhisattva slash my potential to emulate that bodhisattva in some world in the future, right? Depending on my vigor and my bodhi resolve. And now we got to the 10th stage and here's another, here's, here's not another, here's a doubt. So interesting, right? Because Vajra Treasury was afraid of doubts. That's why he didn't want to speak. Well, guess what? It happened. <laughs> here's, here's a doubt. Oh, and everybody's got the same, including the bodhisattvas, have a doubt. And what is the doubt? The doubt is, If a bodhisattva's Psychic ability, wisdom, strength. Shantong zhi li, okay? Li, strength. Zhi, wisdom, knowledge. Shantong, psychic ability, wisdom, knowledge. If the strength of the wisdom of a bodhisattva's psychic powers allow him to swap worlds and all the beings inside are delighted and don't know they've been swapped, right? Can do these things. What can a Buddha do? Okay? So, no slander is going on here. It's not exactly what he was afraid of, but it's, they've taken one more step. They're not listening passively. That's what I like about this. They're listening actively. And they've gone, what you told us was totally mind-ripping, gobsmacking. What's a Buddha like? Right? So it's not so much I don't think, I think I may have misrepresented it. It's not so much that if a bodhisattva can do all this, what's left for the Buddha? You know, is, is the bodhisattva already a Buddha? I don't think it's so much that. It's that the bodhisattva is truly mind-blowing. What's a Buddha like? Right? It's like they're, 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 they want to know about the Buddha, not so much about 
is the Bodhisattva already a Buddha? It's not a negative. It's a what's going on with the Buddha, can you imagine, right? So I want to say again, I appreciate the freedom and the room at this level to do creative, critical thinking within cultivation. It's encouraged within Buddhism. And that was always, always the case with Master Shri Hua. He, uh, we learned later that this was not uh, a commonplace thing in the Mahayana Sangha necessarily in China. Um, but that may have been more a cultural thing than a, a standard Buddhist thing. The, the standard uh, trope as we understood it, kind of the protocol in a sutra lecture was you don't dare ask the lofty monk who is doing the lecturing. Um, it was seen as probably in a Chinese classroom uh, you didn't challenge the teacher, right? Uh, you, you don't, you can't say those things. You don't say, I didn't get it. You, you explain it again. The, there's no sense that the instructor is your employee and if you're not satisfied, you want your money back or a better product. That's not the way it, education happens in the Chinese context. But Master Hua was a different story. Every time he explained the sutras, which was every 24 hours, we heard a sutra lecture, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday, Shifu would say, okay, who's got a question? If you don't have any questions for me, I'm gonna start examining you to make sure you've understood tonight's lecture because I want you to get it, right? And people would. That kind of environment, that atmosphere of free inquiry and equal, the, the feeling was that you were always encouraged to uh, think freely. Right? There was an atmosphere of shared investigation, mutual investigation. Let's look into it together. And at that level, that was so neat because why? You could meet Shurfu's mind. He encouraged you. He wanted, it was clear that his priority was not being right. His priority was not being the authority. There's no value there at all. Clearly, he was the authority. But that was not the agenda in a sutra lecture. The agenda in the sutra lecture was, let me see what the Dharma has done to your mind. Tell me, right? I wanna hear what you're thinking about this teaching. And I'll listen, how about you? How about, what do you think about what he said, right? This activating inherent wisdom was the agenda. And everybody had a share, right? That was so cool. And here it's reflected right in the Avatamsaka Sutra, right? These uh, bodhisattvas, gods, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, kings of heaven, chakra, maheshvara, right? Brahma and the pure dwelling gods are expressing their interest in the teaching and their inability to fit what they've heard into their current categories. They heard too much to fit, right? It was too much, this description of the bodhisattva's abilities. And so their thought was, geez, what about the Buddha in this case, right? So I somehow, I just want to point that out and think that's a very healthy intellectual environment. I respond to that because it's in encouraging us to grow. There's no fear that you can't have that thought, right? That thought is not a threat, which I respond to. I mean, to, to be asked, uh, knowing that there's no risk for me to get it wrong, of course I'm going to get it wrong. I can't I'm not a bodhisattva at this level. I don't have the capacity to understand this. So your wrong 
your lack of understanding is welcome because the goal is to expand the quality and the capacity of your mind, right? That's a healthy place to grow. Safe, well-lit place for spiritual thinking and insight. Yes. So I, I totally respond to this. Compare that to dogma. Okay, here's the truth. Let me hear it. Oh, you said it wrong. You are an infidel. <laughs> you are a heretic, right? You said it, you got it wrong. You can die if you don't repeat it exactly the way I said it, the way I heard it, the way it was passed down. You know? Nothing but fear. Who's going to go there? You know? So the words heretic and infidel, not in this assembly, right? So if bodhisattvas have powers of wisdom and spiritual abilities like this, what about the Buddha? Fu fu yun he. Okay, now, all right, we're clear on that much. What does Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva do? Okay. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. I jumped ahead. Moon of Liberation is now going to rephrase, rephrase what's happening. Ready? Pusa. Chin did I say it right? Let me say it one more time. Shan zai ren zhe wei duan bi yi. There we go. Wei duan bi yi dang shao shi xian. Pu sa shen li zhuang yan zhe shi. Okay. We said it right. Here we go. Make it bigger so we can read it. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Then, moon of liberation bodhisattva, knowing what the multitudes in the assembly were thinking, ask Vajra treasury bodhisattva, disciple of the Buddha, Everyone here, having heard of the powers of wisdom and spiritual abilities of this bodhisattva, have been snared by a net of doubts. Humane one, it would be good indeed if you, in order to cut through their doubts, showed us an example of the majesty of a bodhisattva's spiritual powers. All righty. Moon liberation clearly is not included in the assembly of doubters. He is, he's in a role, he's got a job here. He's called the interlocutor. He's the questioner. Um, Vajra Treasury is the spokesperson. He's the deputy of the Buddha. He's the mouthpiece. Muna Liberation is the, the one who speaks on behalf of the assembly, but clearly he is He's got one foot outside. He knows what's going on and he wants to move the dialogue down the road. So he's the spokesperson for the assembly to get Vajra Treasury to dispense the wisdom on behalf of the Buddha. He says, um, we have heard what you've been telling us about the powers of wisdom and spiritual abilities of the 10th stage bodhisattva and an affliction arose. Doubts are an affliction. Doubts are the mind used wrongly. Right? What's an affliction? Affliction is the mind used in a way that does not lead ahead to clarity, insight, liberation, higher function. Think about your car's tailpipe putting out smoke. That's an affliction of the engine, right? Your carburetor needs adjusting. Your fuel injection needs adjusting. You got exhaust, black smoke coming out your tailpipe. So go get it tuned up. An affliction in the mind is the black smoke coming out the mind's tailpipe. 
so to speak, mixing the metaphor, right? So they got an affliction. They, they couldn't get it. They didn't get it. It's a net of doubts. Uh, the Chinese says, Jin si da zhong, qi wan pu sa. They heard about the shen tong zhi li, the strength of insight of psychic powers, wisdom and psychic powers. Duo zai yi wang. They have fallen into a net of doubts. Interesting that doubts are compared to a net. When was the last time you got netted by something? Um, ah, I know. Walking the tracks here in the Gold Coast bush at night and meeting a spider web. <laughs> right? In the dark. Ah, where's the spider? Oh, I hope he's not going to come around my ear, you know. So we have, we have massive, massive arachnids here in the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. And uh, when they, uh, they are very, very active. And I've, uh, when <laughs> Sam used to drive me uh, from our residence yonder on that, that hill over there to, to the Buddha hall where I'm sitting at night, uh, it would usually be just at sunset. I come over to lecture and Two hours later, having done the work and finished the lecture, we would drive back and the same road that we had passed two hours earlier now would have a, a spider web across it, 30 feet, 20 feet. In the time that we were up, some very enterprising, amazingly, magically skillful orb weaver spider had covered the road with a web, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. And if you get webbed in with an arachnid, I know there are people who are, you know, spider phobic, and I don't want to uh, increase your keep. I'm not doing the uh, Tourist Bureau of Queensland any favors by talking about these. But it's true. Uh, when you get webbed in by a good orb weaver web, you can't get it off. You get it and it sticks to your hand. And the more you pull, the more it sticks. And, you know, you have to kind of take time to, to wipe it off. That's a net of doubts. You pull on one strand and three more stick you over here and you cut through this one and it pulls down there. So a net of doubts is a really good image of what has happened to the minds of the assembly. What to do, what's to do about that. So Bajra Treasury answers his own question. He says, would you please Picture is worth a thousand words. Someone say, "Yi jian ru." Let's see, "Yi jian ru qian wen." Is that the, how do you say it? Make a cheng yu. "Yi jian bu." A picture is worth a thousand words. How do you say it? By, by one bu ru yi jian. Thank you. Uh, opportunity to express appreciation for the team of volunteers who put this lecture on the air, both in California and here in the Gold Coast, so that friends in China, friends around the world, people watching on Zoom, people watching on YouTube can hear and see. So what a chance for me to learn to improve my Chinese. Bai wen bu ru yi jian. A hundred hearings not worth one seeing says the Chinese. Picture's worth a thousand words. There we go. We truly are a global species when, we, when even our idioms match, right? So a hundred hearings don't, don't match up to a single sight. Picture's worth a thousand words. He says, humane one, you, Vajra Treasury, would you please, in order to cut through those doubts, in order to swipe the spider web in a single grasp, Show us an example of the majesty of a bodhisattva's spiritual powers. I come from Missouri, the show me state. It is indeed the show me state. I want to see it. I don't want to hear you talk about it anymore. Can you please explain what's going on? We'd like to see it. Okay. And what I like is the next line. What happens? Ready? One more quick line here. 
，使金刚藏菩萨即入一切佛国度，体性三昧。入此三昧时，诸菩萨及一切大众，皆自见身在金刚藏菩萨身内。At that time, Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva entered the samadhi of the substance and nature of Buddha's lands. As soon as he entered that samadhi, the bodhisattvas and the great assembly saw their own bodies placed within the body of Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva. One more line. I stopped too soon. Yu zhong xi jian san qian da qian shi jie suo you. 种种庄严庄严之事，今欲一劫说不能尽。In his body, they saw all the various particulars of adornment of the billion-world universe, a state that could not be entirely described, even through coatings of eons. Oh boy, oh boy! Vajra Treasury is up to it. He's ready. He is prepared to cut through the net of doubts. So what does he do? He says, "Yeah, I've been talking, 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 talking. I'm going to show you instead. You yourself will get your own answer to your question. You want to know about Fu Fu Yun He? If the Bodhisattva can do that, what about the Buddha? Here we go. Fasten your psychic seat belts. Ready?" Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva entered a samadhi of the substance and nature of Buddha's lands. Okay, so samadhi. This is this is worth it. Worth talking about. Samadhi sanme in Chinese, samodhi sometimes, is a meditative state. In the Avatamsaka Sutra, there are famous samadhis. They have their own names. They are so highly thought of, so powerful, so distinct, that there are other lesser samadhis that accompany this samadhi. When bodhisattvas enter. Or master, or merge with, or integrate with these samadhis. It's hard to get a verb that describes what it's. What's a meditative state like? Certain things happen, and the results of the samadhis are specific to that particular. And I don't want to use the word trance, right? I think that's a mistake.、Um, to my mind, my American, Australian, English. Language mind, a trance is somehow associated with loss of control. Everybody saw Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I'm sure you did. Spielberg's film, right? We love Indiana Jones. There are four or five of them, right? And in the Temple of Doom.、Uh, I, I'm a little hard on Spielberg. He's Spielberg is such a fantastic storyteller, and such a wise man of the world, and understands entertainment and all. He came up with some stereotypes of followers of Eastern religions. Clear, no doubt, no doubt. And he he was lumped at the time for his racist depiction of believers, and. They're all kneeling and they're going、oh, like that, and I looked and I thought, man, Buddhists ought to sue him for slander, right?、Uh, Hindus ought to sue him for slander because he had depicted followers of, say, Eastern religions. No, it's a fictional. He's a story, but one step away from the hordes of. Believers in a trance in the Temple of Doom was, you know,、uh, people bowing, 
I felt it very sensitively because I have done a lot of bowing in public in my life. And here were the believers as Indiana Jones was about to be sacrificed to the god Kalima, Kalima. They went into a trance and lost their powers of reasoning. They lost their kindness. The uh, stereotypical believers in a trance in Spielberg's Temple of Doom, they were um, under the control of a bloodthirsty murderer, right? The high priest. He was horrible, awful. He just loved to kill living beings. And life had no value if you were one of his followers. Okay, stereotypes. And he came to a terrible end. Uh, you remember those scenes. Great, great movie, great entertainment. But it had that aspect of, you know, stereotypical labeling of be true believers as entering a trance and falling under the power of someone who was no longer virtuous. Okay, that's why I don't use the word trance because samadhi has nothing to do with that kind of misrepresentation of what it means to participate in a religion um, similar to the scene described right here in the Avatamska Sutra, right? What's different? If you take, if you think about, if you haven't seen uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, uh, you can remember if you have a chance to watch it. Highly recommend it, great film, really fun. You know, uh, Spielberg's Indiana Jones films are, are just great, right? It has that aspect of um, kind of like, you know, stereotypical cowboys and Indians film. The first peoples, Native Americans, are depicted as bloodthirsty engines, right? They're going to kill you as soon as they see you. They're, they're godless uh, savages. Okay. Nearly identical depiction of the uh, believers in the, in the world that Indiana Jones stumbles into. They are bloodthirsty, they're savage, they, they're, when they follow their teacher and do whatever the trance commands them to do, their eyes roll back into their heads, right? So they're long gone and far beyond the call of humanity or sensitivity or they've sacrificed all of their virtue in order to follow and the, they shake their hands as they bow. Ah, Kalima, like that. They become part of a murderous death cult as soon as they practice, as soon as they enter samadhi, right? Okay, so stereotype. And those stereotypes die hard. They go, they don't, it's hard to get rid of them. Why? We don't have anything wholesome or positive to replace them with. Who in, uh, oh, okay, I got one, I got one. What's the difference between the bodhisattva entering the samadhi of substance and nature of Buddha's lands and an evangelical fundamentalist Pentecostal entering a trance and speaking in tongues, right? Oh, we have our, uh, is, gotta tread carefully here but uh, our current president has a spiritual advisor who has entered into a trance and spoken in tongues in the White House. And what is the difference? Well, I, speaking as a 10-year veteran, professor of Buddhist Christian dialogue, uh, I will say, tread carefully here. Why? Trying to compare phenomenon from two religions when even 
those completely empowered and immersed in one of those religions has a hard time describing and explaining what it is. To, for me to then say, oh, it's like this or it's different is, is going to be not very valuable, right? Comparing phenomenon across religious boundaries is tricky when we're into the realm beyond words and language. Okay, what's going on when a Pentecostalist speaks in tongues? Hmm, that would be a lecture all to itself. Uh, when I taught the class in Buddhist Christian Dialogue, we had the testimony of Marjo, M-A-R-J-O-E, Marjo Gortner. Marjo, uh, still alive, he's, a, he's in the entertainment business now, still. Um, Marjo uh, was a child prodigy of parents who were on the tent preacher circuit in rural America, big cities too. Marjo was able to preach at age four. He performed marriages at age five. He was a gospel preaching child, right? His parents raised him that way. He was part of the show. And for people, you know, it's easy to, to, to laugh or point fingers. For the people who were part of that faith community, Marjo was wonderful. He was, there are pictures of him. He married sailors with their brides. And, you know, he was uh, part of their, he was, he was in, a, in a boring year of church meetings to have Marjo preach uh, from the pulpit probably was a good way to stay awake, you know. Okay, Marjo grew up and became a whistleblower. He was part of my baby boomer hippie generation. So we're the same age. And at a certain point, he turned, the word was apostate, right? He, he turned his back on the training that he had been given by his parents and said, uh, don't believe a lot of what you see when miracles are involved. And he described what it means to talk in tongues, glossolalia. And he said, it's, it's a skill you learn. You know. Now, does that mean nobody ever talks in tongues authentically? Not at all, no. But Marjo talked about how people would say, you know, spontaneous healings. You would take a chicken heart go to the market and buy chicken hearts instead of drumsticks and wings, put them in a sleeve, and uh, somebody would, in the middle of the preaching, the piano, the music is playing, bonka, 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 and the people are coming, walking down to the altar to get healed, and he would take his hand and hit them on the head, and they would spontaneously cough up a tumor. Hallelujah, they've been healed! And the chicken heart would be held up. This is the tumor they coughed up. And people would, you know, they would be thrilled to see a miracle of healing. And, you know, this is all in the realm of faith and belief and magic. And so you have to, these are tender, tender feelings that we have. This, these are, it's a, uh, the mind of religion, the mind of faith is, has been wondered about and exploited and developed and purified for as long as humanity has walked on two legs, right? So I'm not gonna to, to be critical of things that I don't fully understand. So there is goodness in the tent meetings that Marjo was describing, but he uh, went through difficult times personally this is, my knowledge of Marjo Gortner came from a documentary film made about him called Marjo. You can look it up. I have a copy of it in the monastery. And it's, you know, I had to look at myself. I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm a convert. I was raised Methodist and I'm now a Buddhist monk. And people look at me with the same kind of hunger and thirst for truth that Marjo's believers in the tent looked at him. But he grew up and he was going through all kinds of 
of authority challenges like any adolescent coming into young adulthood and into maturity. And he had to step away from what his parents gave him. And then he returned. He went back realizing that there was goodness and he stripped away a lot of the phony baloney showmanship that is part of the entertainment slash religious uh, industry and wanted people to really find the goodness in devout belief in Jesus and he did you know so it was it was refreshing in the end to have Marjo say yeah uh, let's be careful about falling into a trance okay so whenever I say samadhi we have to can't use the word trance that's what I'm talking about in my in my context I want to be sure that we find something accurate to describe what is going on when Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva enters the samadhi of the substance and nature of Buddhist lands. Because why? He, number one, when he does this, it is the result, it's the second step of three. What is the first step? It's called precepts. What is the second step? It's called samadhi. What's the third step? It's called wisdom, right? You don't get to the samadhi part of this formula without having gone through the precept part of the formula, which is what? It's who Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva is as a person. There is no samadhi without goodness, without his maximizing his human nature for goodness, for virtue. Right? Another way to say it, it's who you are. The goodness that you manifest, that then when you practice, in this case, probably seated meditation, but not necessarily. It might have been some other practice. Devotion could have been a different kind of yoga that he was using. But based on the goodness of his nature, the shaping that happens in the second step, the samadhi, which is called cheng ding cheng shou, right focus, right reception, right use of the body, the six senses, that then transforms the darkness of ignorance into the light of wisdom, right? So my point is, this is not magic. This is technology. It's tools the Buddha passed on that he himself mastered and said, we can too. Should we use them the way he did it? So samadhi is the second step. It's precise. It's not murky. It's not mystical. It's not uh, a trance that I don't want you to watch because there's something behind the curtain that you if you saw it you'd go oh you're just as phony as the other hucksters right not at all this is public domain this is creative commons stuff how you enter samadhi and he's been doing it for a very long time so he's good at it okay now that's basic samadhi the word um Master Hua would use it all the time. He would say, hey, Guo Zhen, he would say, when you're driving the van, don't enter Samadhi, right? And I remember uh, one of our favorite Dharma brothers, Bhikshu Hung Ju, uh, the first three steps one Bauma, Tim Testu, um, was, <laughs> He was sitting with myself and Marty, uh, former Bhikshu Hung Chao. He had picked us up on Highway 1, heading down to Gold Wheel Temple, where Shurfu was in Los Angeles. We were going to have a weekend with our teacher. So our pilgrimage got, we marked where we stopped our bowing. Here's the big dragon 
school bus, the yellow school bus with the dragon painted on it, Dharma Realm Buddhist University. By the side of the road, how thrilled we were. Here's the bus full of friends and uh, we can jump on and park our car behind the, the billboards so nobody can see it, head down to see our teacher. Okay, so Bhikshu Hongju who was driving the bus said to Marty, he says, hey, Hong Chao, he says, you wanna drive the bus? Marty's like, yeah, sure I do, this is fun. So Marty, wanting to keep his mind clear, had his recitation beads in his hands, right? And so Tim, or Bhikshu Hongju, puts Marty in the driver's seat. He sits on the, the seat beside him to watch him because it's a different gear shift, different clutch, you know, there's eight speeds and all. And so Marty has got his beads in his hand and he's reciting the Great Compassion Mantra while he's shifting the gear shift and his beads wrap around the gear shift. And so he's like, you know, like suddenly, uh-oh, the, the bus is, you know. And so Bhikshu Hungju, Tim Testu says, hey, he says, don't enter samadhi, turn one dharma wheel at a time, he said. You're trying to turn two dharma wheels, turn one dharma wheel at a time. The steering wheel is the one you're turning right now, put your beads down. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, turning one dharma wheel at a time. Master Hua would say, don't ru ding, bu yao ru ding. Don't enter samadhi while you're driving. You got to be a driver while you're driving, you know. So, it's not that kind of trance, not that kind of, of, that's not what samadhi is. However, the samadhi that we're talking about, which can mean clarity of mind, keenness of insight, right? You see further when you're in samadhi, uh, that kind of focus, samadhi sometimes means focus. We know about the dhyana samadhi, chanding, we hear about the jhanas in, in the Theravada tradition. They talk about jhanas, chanding, those kinds of meditative states. Here in the Avatamsaka Sutra, when this bodhisattva enters a samadhi, this is a famous samadhi, right? This is a special kind of meditative state that has these qualities to it. It's got a name. What is it? the samadhi of the substance and nature of Buddha's lands. Wow, so this is a special samadhi that Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva has selected in order to illustrate what he's been trying to explain so that the assembly, when they see him do this and what happens, they're gonna go, Oh, now I get it. Now I see what you were trying to say. Uh, right? I understand it now. That's, so he has decided to show and not tell, which I think is also very cool. That he can, that he can do this. He doesn't have to, you know, you think of the rabbis who are arguing about the, you know, the Mishnah and famous Rabbi Ezekiel is trying to illustrate a point of Hebrew theology and to all the other rabbis who are sitting around and knowing that anything he says, they're gonna cut it to ribbons with their, their philosophies and, and probably Rabbi Ezekiel didn't have the Samadhi to use to illustrate. Wouldn't have been wonderful if you know the rabbis arguing about the Torah, if they could have shown and not told, you know. I'm, I'm one who loves uh, the, uh, the, the exposition of, of Jewish wisdom in, found in the, in the commentaries to the Torah. And if they, could, if they could have entered Samadhi, you know, or just said, go daven, I'm not gonna say anymore. Let's all go, go do your praying and and it will come to you, you know. Can't do that, not like our bodhisattva. So he enters the samadhi, and what happens? As soon as he enters that samadhi, the bodhisattvas and everybody in the assembly saw their bodies placed within the body of Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva. Like what? Right? 
And in his body, they saw all the various particulars of adornment of the billion world universe, a state that couldn't be entirely described even if you had the end of time and all the words involved. It couldn't be described. They saw it with their own eyes. Okay, full stop. Like what is going on? He enters the samadhi, everybody in the assembly is suddenly transported into his body. Not only that, but in his body, they see, what's it called? Particulars of adornment. It says, all kinds of things that make this San Qian Da Qian Shi Jie. Now, if Jin Yong Shi is listening, he's going to ding me, he's going to critique me for calling it the billion world universe. Uh, or is that right? Is, if, Qin Chuan, are you, are you on? Or Jin Yong Shi, is it the billion world universe? I still haven't got this right. Our, our Dharma Master Jin Yong has done the math for the San Qian Da Qian Shi Jie. Is it the billion world universe? Did I get it right finally? Can anybody help me out here? I think it's the billion world universe. Anyway, I'll, I'll hear about it later, I'm sure. So this 3,000 great thousand, lar 3,000 great thousand world system is how we used to translate it. That's a Chinglish translation. We've changed it, we've done the math, and it's now a billion world universe. Every aspect of adornment in this universe is now visible to the eyes of everybody in the assembly inside the body of Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva. Holy mackerel. <laughs> oh my goodness, right? That's amazing. What's going on here? To be continued. Cliffhanger, right? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you next week. We're going to find out next week. Stay tuned for further adventures in the body of Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva. Wow, ye, this is amazing. And I think we're going to make sense of this because we have encountered this before. We have met this state. This, this samadhi shares a family resemblance with other states that we have encountered along the way. So stay tuned, hang in there. We're gonna, we're gonna surprise you with some of the things that we're gonna find. Indeed, previews of coming attractions. Now, uh, I wanted to show you some of the wonders we can't travel into Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva's body exactly. Uh, maybe you can. If so, hubba hubba, right? But um, I have a story that I wanted to share. I mentioned Bhikshu Hangju. And uh, he is much beloved. He was a a, one of my inspirations to become a monk, certainly. And uh, one of the, the qualities of Bhikshu Hongju is his honesty and his candor about his own challenges becoming a monk. It was not easy for him to become a monk. He's a, talk about a larger than life personality. And uh, he was also a restless fellow. Uh, he had more spit and vinegar running through his bloodstream than any 10 individuals. He was a, uh, the official diver for the USS Rock, a Navy submarine. So to be a submariner, submariner is already tough. To be the diver for the ship, for the submarine, 
That means you could go out of your submarine. Not only staying in the submarine is hard, you could leave the submarine, do business outside, and come back in. He, I don't think they had Navy SEALs back then, but Tim would have been a Navy SEAL, but he, he served that job for the, for the submarine. He was also court-martialed for stealing the Admiral's yacht in the Philippines, in Manila, in Manila Bay, <laughs> and going for a joyride in, in the, the Admiral's yacht. They, because he was the ship's diver, they let him off. He didn't, he didn't have to go serve time. <laughs> and the only person to tame Tim Testu was Master Shrenhua. Tim put his palms together and bowed to Shifu. He couldn't, Tim couldn't mess with Master Shrenhua. So, uh, he... Uh, made a vow at one point to do a bowing pilgrimage, three steps, one bow, from Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco up to Marble Mount, Washington, east of Seattle. So the distance from San Francisco to Seattle is about a thousand miles. And Tim and his monk companion, Dharma protector, Bhikshu Hung Yo, who was my former college roommate. And if Bhikshu Hung Yo, if you're listening, David, get in touch. Call. <laughs> Want to talk to you. Um, the two of them set off doing three steps and one bow all the way across Golden Gate Bridge, through Marin County, through Sonoma County, through Mendocino County, on up through Humboldt County, across the Oregon line, through the state of Oregon, across the Washington line, through the state of Washington, up to Seattle, and turned right and headed to a uh, piece of property that we had undeveloped that had been given to us called Marble Mount. The story is available to you um, should you care to read it? I did. I went out with my Kindle to Amazon and uh, bought a copy of Tim's book called, got it right here. It is called, uh, there's one copy called Three Steps, One Bow, American Buddhist Monks. 1100 Mile Journey for World Peace, published by Buddhist Text Translation Society. Um, Tim recently, um, his daughter, uh, Jeanette, uh, edited another, what's the, what's the name of Tim's new book? Touching Ground. Touching Ground. Is there a subtitle? Go ahead, you're, you're legit. Touching Ground. I think, is it Wisdom Press who published it? Or Shambhala? Anyway, Tim, Tim's diary, uh, different than Three Steps on Bow, has been recently published. And it's a tell-all book. There's a lot of, it's prior to his leaving home. Three Steps on Bow is the journal of his pilgrimage. You got the details there? Yeah, Wisdom, Wisdom, publications. Wisdom Publications. Touching Ground. An American Buddhist monk's pilgrimage, you know. What it's like to become an American Buddhist monk. Okay, so you can find uh, the details of this. Devotion and Demons Along the Path to Enlightenment. Wonderful subtitle, super good. Okay, so um, I wanted to, to share one of the stories that I was a witness to, not a participant in, but I witnessed it um, because we were there when the, the story was reported back to Gold Mountain. Tim had been told by Master Hua not to drink Coke on the pilgrimage. Don't drink Coke. Because my Dharma brother, uh, Hung Ju, Bhikshu Hung Ju, had a sweet tooth. And he let his sweet tooth get control over him 
if it was not satisfied, he is easy to lose his temper. And you have to know, doing a pilgrimage, three steps, one bow, up the highway, oh my goodness, the pressure to let the, 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 temp, the temptation to let something around you be a pressure outlet, a pressure relief, is strong. Tim would drink Coke if he could, and his, his sugar high would flare up. Or if he couldn't get it, his temper would flare up at poor Hung Yo. So... <clears throat> Occasionally, there would be conflict. And so Master Hua said, uh, He said, So he said, don't drink Coke, because if you do, the sugar gets you high and you get angry. If you can't get it, you get angry or more angry. So that was his instruction. Well, it's hard to follow, because, man, it's the... Uh, the temptation to let it fly when you're, you know, doing what he was doing is so hard to, to hold it. Well, all right. Meanwhile, the pilgrimage itself was kind of superheroic, kind of like a superhero. It's pretty astonishing to see uh, this very tall, very strong Buddhist monk with his palms together taking giant strides and bowing and he, his precept sash was flying behind him like a sail and they covered a, a lot of distance so within nine months they finished 12, 1100 miles myself I took two and a half years to go 800 miles because we went one mile a day slower we bowed slower so Tim and David Hungju, Hungyo the two monks bowing north on a mission for world peace I was profoundly inspired by watching them do this. And uh, to this day, you know, it's amazing that they survived. So they got to a place just outside of Marble Mount. They were two weeks from finishing their pilgrimage. And Hung Ju wrote the following in his, I'm taking this out of the book. He said, another one of those hot, dusty days. Heavy traffic, logging trucks, and affliction everywhere. We bowed along Highway 20 into the little town of Van Horn, Washington. The Olsons, who own the general store and the gas station, invited us in for a, uh-oh, <laughs> cool pop. What is that? Coke. There was a lot of activity around the place. These folks had been hearing about us for months. Now, Hung Yo didn't go into the store because he knew what would happen if Hung Ju had got a Coke. He didn't want to, he wasn't, he was just going to stay outside and recite. So he sat by the cart that they had with their belongings and recited. Tim Hung Ju went in. Kids and dogs were milling around everywhere. At one point, I noticed an old man, short, bearded, and bespectacled, wandering around outside the station. He was talking to the kids, and although I don't think he'd ever been there before, he behaved like he was old friends with everyone. He had a white truck with a homemade trailer behind it, and two dogs that he was trying to give away, right? Tim told me this story himself before he wrote it down. He said, he was amazing. This guy was, he just was everywhere. And he said, who wants my dogs? They're no good to me. And these are these two happy dogs wagging their tails. And, you know, he was using the dogs to kind of shake everybody up a little bit. Who wants my dogs? You know. And uh, he had a, uh, I was taken aback when he walked directly up to me. And Tim was like 6'2", 6'3". This guy came up to his chest and he said, you call yourself a Buddhist, says the guy. I noticed he was totally relaxed and centered. Tim's response, why, uh, 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 yes, I replied, wondering what he was getting at. 
And he says the guy looked, suddenly it was like he filled the whole space of the store and he took his glasses off and he looked him right in the eyes. And he said, you want to hear what the Buddha taught in plain English? He asked. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say no, right? Because that wouldn't be right. I didn't want to say yes, because that would imply I didn't already know. And I'm the bowing monk, says Tim. I looked around and there was a crowd gathering. He had a mischievous gleam in his eye. Uh, 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 what did the Buddha teach? I finally said. Feeling lame, right? The guy says, the Buddha taught compassion. The Buddha said, stop knocking each other around. But most people don't buy it, he said. <laughs> Tim writes, I was sure this little guy could see right through me, but I quickly replied, by what? What the Buddha taught, laughed the little man. I don't think you're a complete convert, he said. Boy, he was really putting me on the spot. But, but I, I didn't say I was perfect, I replied. Talk about a lame answer, defensive. I had shifted totally into my own defense. The little man paused and he moved closer and he looked right into my eyes. Tim says, instantly I flashed on how angry I had become towards Hung Yo during the last few weeks. The Buddha taught compassion. Be more compassionate, he said. Then he took off his glasses and stuck his face 12 inches in front of mine. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend, he said. How many people do you know who would talk to you like this? He said. Right? So <laughs> Tim says at this point, the guy seemed to kind of vanish. He just, and the little kids all follow him and his dogs and they, he bought something and the dogs jumped into the back of the truck and vanished. By this time I was completely overwhelmed, not to mention embarrassed. I'd never seen this guy before, but he zeroed right in on my number as if I was transparent. All the people were looking at me. Everything was quiet. I was absolutely speechless. I didn't know what to do or say, so I went back out on the road without the coke and continued bowing. Only afterwards did I begin to realize just how miraculous an encounter it was. Just as the master had often done, this man was talking right through my false front, directly to my attachments. As I bowed along, I began to feel a sense of shame that I hadn't felt in a long time. Okay. I'd really been mean to Hung Yo in many, many ways. Most of the time it was indirect or subtle. Nevertheless, it was always irritating. I felt terrible about it. I recalled a verse the master once wrote, truly recognize your own faults. Don't discuss the faults of others. Others' faults are just your own. Being of one substance with everyone is called great compassion. I scurried down the highway till I reached the spot where Hung Yo was waiting with the cart. He had missed my little encounter with the old man, so I told him what had happened. We sat down and mixed up some lemonade powder with some fresh Skagit River water. I looked at him directly for the first time in a long time. For a short moment, we shared a smile of silent understanding. I felt old, old, old. Then we both got up and continued on. So that's the letter that that's the, the journal entry that uh, Hung Ju wrote. But because I was there at the time, not at, uh, what's the town? Not at the Olson's grocery store, but because I was at Gold Mountain, the phone rang and I, I answered it. And uh, Hung Yo says, uh, is Shifu there? And I said, uh, Shifu? Sambui Bai Dari Hualai, three steps on bow is calling. And uh, so, because Hung Ju didn't speak enough Chinese, Hung Yo was the communicator. So, Shifu, and what's going on? And 
Hangju through Hung Yo told the story of the encounter with the, the strange guy with the two dogs who said, I'm not your enemy, I'm your friend. Who else would talk to you like this? And Shu said, <laughs> he said, did you bow to him? And, and Hung Ju, no, Shu no, that was Manjushri Bodhisattva and you didn't know enough to bow to him? <laughs> he said, hang, hang the phone up. You know? <laughs> Poor Hung Ju is like, oh no. <laughs> that was my chance to bow to Manjushri Bodhisattva and I didn't recognize him and I blew it, right? So, how wonderful, right? And of course, Shifu took every opportunity to teach us, you know, to, to shake up our certainty that we knew what was right when in fact we were still being driven by habits, by desires, you know. And there will certainly be another chance, there'll be another opportunity. But what an incredible encounter, you know, and how wonderful that Hung Ju was such a good journalist that he told the truth. I mean, this is, a, this is an uncomfortable truth. He's not defending his face, you know. So we can share the encounter later. Plus, notice what a great writer. Tim Testu had a way with prose that puts you right in the scene. Okay, and I will say, you know, even though Hung Ju didn't get a chance to bow to Manjushri Bodhisattva, look at the response that he got from somebody who watched this encounter from a side, totally unknown to Hung Ju, letter from an observer. Dear sirs, on August 5th, I had the privilege of meeting two monks from your monastery on Highway 9 between Lake Stevens and Arlington, Washington. I've forgotten their names, but one was pulling a cart, the other had been kneeling and bowing every third step on their journey from San Francisco. It was a very moving experience to me. And I talked with these two men, they reflected serenity along the busy highway. I've enclosed a short poem that I composed about the experience. Harmony on seeing two Buddhist monks on the road. The vehicles pound the road with a many-minded drumbeat, echoing discordance through all living creatures. Then the gentle flutter of saffron robes in the wind, and all the noise, noise of creation is muted by the quiet thunder of Buddha. Respectfully, Mr. Roland Strandell, as reported in Three Steps, One Bow, American Buddhist Monks, 1100 Mile Journey for World Peace. Great story. So, you know, we who after the fact, uh, because um, Hangju Tim was candid about his, what, failing to, uh, to get enlightened, what, that's not the way to see it at all. Because he told the truth about how difficult it is to, uh, to tame the mad mind, as a result, we can deeply appreciate the, uh, the power of someone who is actually trying to cultivate the way, trying to put the Dharma onto the wild horses of body, mouth, and mind, and watch the sparks that fly as a result. So very powerful. And uh, I love that story. So. All right. And also having a, uh, a good and wise advisor who <laughs> was willing to tell you when you missed Manjushri, right? <laughs> Thanks, Sherpa. <laughs> I'm too late, huh? No, Sherpa would say, try again. Try again. There will be another chance. Okay. Uh, hey, hey. Look. I voted. Check. Ballot status. Accepted. Right? From Alameda County, I got my presidential ballot and the down ticket races as well. 
I got it an email, I filled it out, printed it, put it in an envelope, gave it to Auspost, Australia Post Office, mailed it on the 5th of October, four days later. It was received in Alameda County, and by golly, I voted. And it works overseas. So anybody else who is out of country, do not hesitate to register and vote. There's still a few days to do it. Uh, have your say. Let your voice be heard. So uh, those of you looking at my desktop are wondering what in the world is that? I'll tell you next week. That's a new Dumbara flower. Ooh, every thousand years, once it appears. Magic legends. Some people would say nonsense, <laughs> scientifically untraceable. What is an Adumbara flower? You're looking at it. I'll tell you more about it next week. Okay, uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei, Jin Fo Shi, do you have any announcements for us today? Anybody listen? Still the same, more or less the same schedule. We still have um, Saturday Amitabha recitation and Guanyin recitation at 12 to 1. We'll have Dharma practice Q&A from 1 to 2. Uh, I believe the Medicine Master Sutra lectures are on uh, hiatus till maybe mid or end November. Um, we're also planning for when on Monday to move actually the Guanyin and the Amitabha recitation to 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Mm. This just allows for more time after lunch. So... Uh, for those who regularly join us, we have usually about 50, 60 people a day. So if you just come 1230, that way, um, that's a little bit more time for people to have their lunch. So 1230 to 130. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Because we, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is gearing up again for a third wave in Europe and is hospitalizing and afflicting more people worldwide than ever before, particularly in the United States and in India, Latin America. Um, we are continuing to recite the mantra of Medicine Buddha. His Yao Shi Guan Ding Chen Yan, it's called, the true true words, the spell for putting sweet dew on the crown of the head. This is the Medicine Buddha Mantra. And we have it in Sanskrit, and we've got a good melody for it. And it fits the banjos nicely. So instead of a transference of merit, instead of a dedication of merit that we traditionally do, we're going to use a different melody to transfer merit with. The mind of transference is the same. We say, I give away all the goodness that comes from sitting with the Avatamsaka Sutra and wholesome friends here in Gold Coast or in Berkeley or in California or anywhere on the planet where you might be listening to this lecture. All that goodness, all that harmony and Fa Shi, joy within the Dharma, that's a quantity that I can transfer. There's actually something there. The power of virtue and the blessings of peace and harmony, we can give it away with a thought. How do you want to... Why is this underlined? Is that misspelled? Anointing? Is that the right way to spell it? Um, we can give that away, and how you want to do it is entirely up to you. Please make a wish and say, I dedicate that merit. No, I want this word, please. And use my spell checker, spelling window. It, okay, must be right. All right, there we go. So do that, make it, make it tailor your wish how you want to transfer merit. Uh, it's entirely up to you. I dedicate this merit to, with the wish that, fill it in. 
okay? And make your mind big. Make COVID-19 go away. Right? Make AIDS go away. Make malaria go away. Uh, make excessive atmosphere harming gases go away so that the fires will go away. Um, so however you want to transfer the merit, please do. The only thing that I would hope you would do is that you would transfer. How you do it is up to you. Let's sing this mantra three times together. Here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vaisajyaku Vaiduriya Prabharajaya Bhagavatagataya Arahate Samyak Sambhudaya for goodness come true. See you all next week. Looking forward to it. Hope this mantra keeps running through our hearts and our minds all week. to the Venerable Master. See you all next week, everyone. Amitofor.